Welcome to the Idea Land podcast, hosted by Ravi Kamati Reddy. John Ewing is a 20 year veteran Hollywood director of photography and colorist. You can see his work on everything from the hit show Pawn Stars to Jay Leno's Garage. John talks to Ravi about life behind the lens, how to operate real cameras, and the tools that help turn the average person into filmmakers. What's going on, dude? Good to see you. Awesome to touch base. I'm glad I got a hold of you because I have so many questions. But what is new in the a world of Hollywood? Tell me everything. Uh, it seems I, I found my own little uh, nook, and it, it feels somewhat like a race to the bottom, if if that makes sense. Where really everybody wants to do things for cheaper, except for like uh, real big blockbuster type things that they already have a big marketing campaign behind you know, the comic book stuff and if it just it feels they don't want to invest in new ideas that not that they don't invest in new ideas but they, when it comes to investing in, in movies it's hard to know if you're going to make good money on it or not so you know the big studios go after sure shots i guess you could say the they want to make they want to make sure they're going to make their money back it's a it seems like a departure from the 70s when i i, I feel like the, the best writing was happening for the big screen. Now it's the best writing seems to be happening for TV. It's more like what's going on the big screen is what I was just saying, where they're not investing, but what's going on the streaming services, that's where the ideas are. That's where the uh, the good writing is. And they found on those TV shows, they can just keep you going season after season because you get those episodic shows where it's another way to draw out the stories it's not just for 90 minutes it's multiple seasons 12 episodes that's that kind of thing I, yeah I, I completely agree with you actually just from a consumer standpoint not being in the industry per se what is going on there because it seems like there could be a situation where there's a couple of huge bets like these marvel movies and this superhero obsession if you ask me it's just mm -hmm. overkill at this point it's like how much more can we do that you make a couple of bets and the budgets for these things are like approaching you could buy a fleet of fighter jets yeah. With the last. I seriously, I said a billion dollars. It costs like $2 billion to go to Mars and drop that thing off, the uh -huh. rover. That was like the <laughs> yeah. gross. It's like the last five Marvel movies you could pay for like NASA missions. What is yeah. going on? Why don't they just pull back on some of those budgets and go, we're going to make a lot of smaller bets, but be a little bit more risky, take more risks with smaller projects and give more directors a chance that's it it's just that's just it's i just think they're risk averse they're just going for the safest bet and it's kind of like they you know, as far as the marketing goes they have they, ha they seem to have a already built-in uh marketing campaign going it you know it started years ago whenever they started making these movies and before that it, first you drew in the original comic book fans and then it, it's so easy for them that's why they do the star wars is too those go way back so it's like these long drawn out marketing campaigns with brand recognition that's it's really brands is what it is whereas they, they find people they can target an audience much easier on a streaming service with episodic show and they can draw it out and over time maybe they get the target audience but maybe the show's a hit and then word of mouth or whatever happens and suddenly the second season has a, a bigger audience and and it just builds from there or it fizzles out they paid for one season they didn't have to spend that much money and it goes away try again with the next one so the experimentation seems to be, the good stories seem to be on the streaming TV side of things. So um, what's that like with the streaming TV side of things? Because Netflix always, I think I read a book where they're talking about Netflix was this big tech company. So it's like Silicon Valley coming barging in 200 miles south into LA. And apparently everyone in LA was like, who the hell are you? And why do you think you can do this? So how did they succeed, yeah. John? Did they come in? What was it like on the inside of the industry when Netflix came in? I think they succeeded a lot to because you didn't have to sit there and watch commercials. Even e e DVRs, you could you could fast forward through it, but even then, I have to do that now. I can, I, and 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 I can maybe I've missed a show for the last two seasons. Now I can binge it and finish it off in in a day where I have nothing to do. Well, I didn't. I guess I didn't really notice it too much. Where it just happened around me, and a lot of the stuff I was working on was still cable. I've. I don't even know if I've really worked on anything for Netflix yet. And it seems like a lot of these cable services are, and and just the major networks are playing catch up. Like Peacock, when that was recent, right? Yeah, that was um, recent. And I've been sitting there, yeah. And I've been sitting on these shows 
watching Netflix build up around us, and they've they got some pretty cool reality content, and they have, on top of uh, the, the scripted stuff they have. So I've been sitting here watching it and, and thinking, like, why... If Discovery Channel is hurting for money, which apparently they are, but ad revenue is going down from uh, these cable services, why set up a streaming service, see what happens. And I've been saying, I, I feel like I've been saying that for maybe not 10 years, but close to it. That yeah. seems to be when cable started falling away and, and streaming started coming in. So, yeah, I think part of that is because they're stuck in the old business model, the old cable TV business model, which is all ad sales driven. And I don't know why they don't uh, pivot and try to go for uh, streaming side of things. Yeah, I don't know. That seems like a big risk for them. They're probably just discomfort. It's like the innovator's dilemma, right? It's like when you're fat and happy, yeah. you don't want to change. Yeah. And now they've yeah. got like, the selection pressure. It's like, hey, the writing's on the wall. The Peacock thing, what's funny about Netflix, and I'd love to get your opinion on actually what you're watching, what you like, but interestingly, I'm going to make a prediction that falls along these lines. I, I saw some statistics because I think they're really like they keep the numbers close to their chest on what people are watching and how much money things yeah, cost, you know, all their budgets and stuff. But apparently, like, majority of it is just shows that have already been canceled. Like, most people on Hulu and huh? Netflix are watching stuff that was old shows like MacGyver and, you know, Knight Rider and Star Trek and, and yeah. all that stuff that's just off the air now. So it's not even that yeah. much of like, the newer stuff. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I guess you could say when they're there, there's probably like, a handful of really good new things, but with the amount of content they have on all these streaming services, most of it is old stuff. I don't know. I, it was interesting. I saw a Reddit comment about this. I don't know today or yesterday, talking about how it feels like, especially with comedy, is people are going back and watching stuff like pre two thousand twelve. Maybe it's because you can't. You got to be careful what you laugh at these days. And so I think the example they brought in this comment was Thirty Rock. Like a lot of stuff on Thirty Rock wouldn't stand up today. Thirty Rock? Yeah. That wasn't even that long ago. I know. That's crazy. I know it wasn't that long ago. And I didn't watch that show that much. I yeah, never catch it every now and then. But I, I don't know if if it really. I I, I just laughed at it. Like I it just. I didn't have the filter to say, oh, no, they can't say that. I don't know. I think also people are just caught up in this. We're just like pining for the old days. Yeah. We're, we're, what are you watching now? What are you watching with the fan? Oh, so not, I, I tend to watch stuff on my own. I, I, oh, and all of my wife has something on. I'll watch it. Like the last thing we watched together was Queen's Gambit, which I love. Okay. Uh, it was shot amazing. The cinematography alone is worth the watch. The subject matter was good. The acting was good. That was probably the most recent thing. I watched with her. Before that, I, I was watching Ozark. Just mostly oh, because, man, you know, that's too close to home. That's just there. that's too close to home. I Kat was watching Ozark, and she's you want to watch this? I'm like hell no, because I'm gonna <laughs> guess what it's gonna be like. And I called five things in the show that exist. She's like, how did you know? I'm like, we had a lake house on the Ozark. I know exactly what those people are like. I know yeah. the town. Well, I know here, everything. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I, I was watching it, and it's been a long time since I've been down to the Lake of the Ozarks, but. I'm looking at the the scenery and the the backgrounds, and I'm like, there's too many pine trees. Yes. And I come to find out they shoot in Georgia, which that makes sense. But I'm like, okay, it looks a little bit like the lake, but there's too many pine trees. I don't remember that many pine trees being totally. uh, in and around the the lakes. Yeah, um, totally. From a from a standpoint of why I like the show, I, I don't know. It gives me the same feeling that like Breaking Bad gives me, like where you're just watching these people just do, like. Why are you doing this? Quit. <laughs> stop. Take, be an informant. Just stop. You can stop right now. And then you just kind of want to see what train wreck they've uh, created for themselves. Yeah, it's so. like the most creative train Yeah. And those people can get pretty creative with their train wrecks down there, like the Ozarks for sure. Okay. Yeah. So that's an interesting <laughs> that's an interesting segue into the idea of people getting into trouble. Because it seems like your work, a lot of the stuff you've been involved in is another train wreck of some sorts, which is reality TV. So can you talk yeah. about your whole journey, maybe even zoom out to the beginning and just your whole, your piece of the jigsaw puzzle is, is camera and okay. DP, right? How did you get yeah. into that? Like we can go back to high school with that. Really? I don't, yeah. did you take the film studies class from Dr. Oh, Riddick? Oh yeah. Uh, that was hands down and I'm probably gonna offend people with saying this. That was the best class I took in high school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It shifted me from going to art school. And I had been taking all the art classes and I had a portfolio yeah. and I got into some decent art schools. And But I, I was going to do a graphic design. 
And I realized graphic design was just going to be sitting in front of a computer all day. Yeah. And w- watching some of the films in, in that class, I, I kind of just one day decided, I just was like, you know what? Wonder wonder what a cinematographer does. Let me look this up. Let me see what I can find. And so this is like halfway through senior year. So I had to make a decision and I scrambled to find a film school and I found Kansas, like the sworn blood of me of Mizzou, all that kind of, you know. but Kansas had yeah. a film school. So I went yeah. and I would not recommend people go to film school. Really? To to Why? School. It's a great place to network and it's a, maybe it's a good place to go, especially if you're going to go to the big two, NYU or USC, where you can network. And if you go to those two schools, you're going to meet a lot of people. And I would say if you're going to do that, then you want to go to the producer route or try to become an executive at a studio, something like that. But if you're going to do what I did, I wouldn't recommend it because a lot of what I most of what I've learned, I learned on the job. I came out in 2003 and I had two contacts, an old my dad's old friend who had been doing industrials out here for years. What's that? Mean? And industrials would just be like internal company videos. Like I, when I first came out, I started uh, he had a, a contract with SoCal Edison, which is the electric company. So we were going out and watching training or shooting training videos or watching them fix the bulk transmission lines after high winds or fires destroyed them. And it's, it's all relevant to everything I did. I, I was learning camera work or lighting or all that kind of stuff. It doesn't matter what kind of thing you're working on, at yeah. least at this time. It's all the same. And I, I met some people. I met a, a, a gaffer, and a gaffer is the chief lighting technician, if, for those who don't know. I met the gaffer for Curb Your Enthusiasm doing that. Nice. When he's not doing Curb Your Enthusiasm, he's going to make money whatever way he can. That's doing industrials. I've done infomercials. Anyone's the people, anyone's the, really? Anyone's the people would know infomercials? Uh, I did a lot of stuff for those sh- shark products like the shark vacuum products okay my favorite though was an adult arousal product called touch and tingle <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite and Are, that was is this on imdb somewhere on your like do you have a credit for touch and tingle i don't think i don't think my credit would be imdb would not probably cover infomercials but anyway so i, I came out and i learned I, I did a lot of grip and lighting to start with I, I came out wanting to be a camera assistant in those days film was still pretty relevant it still kind of is, but nowhere near the, what it was back then. And I, I remember, so I, I'd hit up Craigslist to try to find jobs. So I found one Craigslist ad for a loader. And the loader's the guy who you load the film mags. And that's pretty much all you do. Very high pressure job because you have to do it in a changing bag. So you can't see what you're doing. You have to do it by feel. And they, so they didn't hire me because I didn't have a lot of experience doing that. I'd, I'd done a little bit in college, but not on 35 millimeter film on, on high dollar cameras. It was like old windups and stuff like that. So just um, to set the stage just a so, little bit here, but so you got out of film school and you thought, I'm just going to go do this route and follow this contact and make this move to LA where I basically yeah. hardly know anybody and I'm just going to go for it. Yeah. And I spent a year in, in Columbia before I, w- I went out with trepidation because it's, uh, you really are throwing yourselves to the wolves and you got to find a, a side job. So when I did come out, I framed houses for a little while and I could come and go f- with, with that job just to have some income while I'm trying to establish myself in whatever way I can. And so that, that loader job, they didn't hire me to do that, but they're like, you can be a grip. We just don't, you don't think, we don't think you have enough experience loading mags. So why don't you join our grips? And actually it was uh, looking back on it. I think it was a great experience for me because if I had gone the camera assistant route, probably yeah. would have been spending a lot more of my time futzing with the camera, which is kind of something that, at least with, in the film world, started going away a little bit. It's, yeah. it's still there, but that stuff, like the camera stuff, I can pick up pretty easy anyway. I like cameras. I know my way around them. Lighting, I didn't. And grip and lighting are kind of grips. If, if the electricians or set lighting techs bring you the light, the grips are one to shape it, diffusion and, and cutting it with flags and stuff like that, as well as how you mount the camera. Are we going to put it on a crane, on a dolly? And the grips are the engineers of the set. They're building things that need to be built for photographic reasons and beyond. So I learned a lot just doing that. And honestly, I probably would have been pretty happy if I'd stayed with that. But hmm. at the same time, I'm meeting people who have little projects to shoot. So I, I, I met a guy whose uh, cousin was an MMA fighter, and I'd shoot his fights and kind of the pre, pre-hype stuff like that. And so because of that, then I got hired through a friend of one of my good friends, Rob Harry, who I don't know how he, he had done another documentary and was able to get funding to do this uh, documentary in Madagascar. 
So that was, I, I would say that was my first big break to actually like shoot oh. documentary. Never saw the light of day. How did it feel just to be like on, how did it feel just to be on board with that? Like when you got, when you found out that you were like part of that crew? It was, at first I was just like, what? And it was a small crew. It was myself. Yeah. The, that guy. Uh, his name's Dan Lindsay, and he went on. He actually went on to direct with a partner, Oscar-winning documentary called Undefeated, from I think 2011. At that time, though, we were both pretty pretty new. At first, when I found out that he was even going, I was like, "Really, Madagascar? <laughs> of all the places? What? Was like an, yeah. I'm assuming it's a nature documentary or something." No, it's about a folk fighting sport in Madagascar called Meringi. Unfortunately, it never saw the light of day. We got there. They had done a lot of setup work with a minister of sport who, as once we got there, we found out that he had set up everything to make him look good and not have a good story. We had to scrap everything that can, had been set up and find two fighters in, this, in the city we ended up in, which was a, a city in the very northern tip of Madagascar called Antsaranana, or they call it Diego Suarez is a colonial name for it. So we found two fighters and they were going to be facing off at a big tournament at the very end of our time there, which was one month. And we just follow them and they're speaking Malagasy. We had a translator, but he could speak English, but he couldn't write it very well. So I think <laughs> what ended up happening is we couldn't transcribe the footage when we got back to LA. Oh. And it just, it never went anywhere. I don't even what, know if it got edited. What was that shoot like, though, on the ground? What were you doing? Oh, uh, it was amazing. Yeah, I, I was uh, like the director of photography, and uh, it was the first time I'd ever been to that part of the world. So I just, uh, my eyes were wide open all the time. And sometimes I think I was maybe too caught up in, in the personal experience than I was actually concentrating on the story that was at hand. But yeah, amazing. And I'd love to I'd love to find a way to, to actually go back and make a documentary about this folk fighting sport because it was really cool. I wish I could have seen more of the island. We really only ended up staying in that little northern city and kind of maybe taking little forays to the south a couple hours away, but always going back to Diego. But it was good. You know, there's one night we're hanging out with one of the fighters. Like one of them lived in kind of the outskirts in a shanty of the city, while the other lived way out in the countryside and was kind of more of a shepherd. Yeah. The one night we're in the, the shanty town, and his brothers and sisters have a table full of fruit. And suddenly this lemur comes jumping <laughs> down from the roof, crawls down a tree and snags a couple bananas and then takes off. <laughs> so I was like, that was my, that's how I saw a lemur. I didn't see them in the wild. I saw them in a, a, a shantytown neighborhood. So uh, just so everyone knows what like a director of photography is, like what were your responsibilities and what's like a typical day? Cause it seems, that seems hard. It just seems like there's a lot of responsibilities. Yeah. In the documentary world, you can, as a, a director of photography can, photography, can be one person. Like, And then not only are you the director of photography, but you're doing your camera assistant stuff. You're uh, changing batteries. You're loading media. You're doing it all. On, the, on a more of a scripted side of things, you're more delegating. So you're talking to your chief lighting technician and you're saying, I want sunlight coming in through the window, blah, blah, blah. You talk to your grip and you say, cut that by two stops. So you're... Then you're talking to art department and you're saying, can you, that wall's too saturated red. Do you have a, a, a lighter shade of red? You're talking to wardrobe. You're saying no, no white shirts. You're, and then of course you're talking to the director about, okay, what, how are we going to block this scene out? And so it's a lot of different things. It depends on what you're doing. And the uh, documentary world, it's a lot more just putting your camera on, on something and following it and making sure that you're always rolling and you're always aware, you're aware of the story. And when you're doing documentary, when it comes to gear and your camera, you really just want something that's gonna be reliable, help you tell the story, not get in the way of you telling the story. Unless some documentaries do have crews where you can pass a camera off to a, a camera assistant and they can do what they need while you have another camera. There's a lot of things to it. it, it it's very much a situational thing. And you just got out of film school. Did you know how to do all this stuff? Or was this like a lot of just very rapid learning on the job? There was a lot of very rapid learning on the job. The one thing film school gave me was it taught me how to shoot film. So it taught me how to think in, in terms of how you have to think when you're shooting film, which is a good carryover for digital. Um, yeah, obviously, you can see the results in digital right away, but it's still a good idea to use some of those principles. So, yeah, in college, I learned the very basics. And so when I came out, 
like I said, I got in with uh, grip and electrician crews and I learned the nuts and bolts of that side of things. And I, I did more electric work, set lighting tech work than I did grip work. So I learned a lot about like lights, like what this light does, how much um, amperage it takes. I learned like uh, when to use bounced light, when to use hard light, different types of bounced material. Grips will build big 12 by 12 um, frames and then pull like there's a material called ultra bounce, which is like a very white material or checkerboard, which is like ultra bounce and like a, a silver or gold lame. Or like I learned how to flag, like the director of photography might say that light needs, you need to take that light off the back wall. So you get a flag and you find where the cut needs to be made and you mount it up with one of my favorite things in the business are C stands. C stands are like a special, they have, I, they're hard to describe. I could really only show you but you can mount something in almost any position you want with one. And I think C-Stand comes from Century Stand, which uh, means like 100 uses, something like that. That's, that's the story they go with anyway. So you just learn to do um, all this, basically. Yeah, you learn to do all of it. You're going to make some mistakes. You learn from your mistakes. Did you make any? You, yeah, oh, yeah. The, the worst possible one I probably made when I was an electrician, you're dealing with two different voltages. You're either doing with uh, 120 volts which comes out of our walls. Some of the bigger lights need uh, 240 volts. So I had been working with a 6K, which needs, you, you need to, when you plug it in, you need to make sure you're plugging it in for 240 volts. And there's different ways you can do that, but there was this uh, situation when we were in, uh, shooting in a shopping mall and I'm moving quickly. I take, it's called a, it's called a snake bite and it's basically like a, it's got ground, a neutral and a hot. What I ended up doing was plugging in the ground and then two hots when it was, it was a light that only needed 120 volts but i made it 240 volts and it was a kino flow light which is a fluorescent light luckily because if it was a, a tungsten light it probably would have exploded the bulb instead it just it popped all the fuses going to each and it was a thousand dollars in damage on the light no no explosion explosions of glass or anything like that <laughs> so, hey you I mean, live and learn yeah you live and learn you got your voltages always know the requirements of the light and uh, then, then I, I never did it again. I, I learned from that. But you came back, so this Madagascar documentary never got made then. And so uh -huh. what did you move to from there? So now that's a bummer. You learn, yeah. you find that out. You're like, hey, we did all this work. Yeah, Hell. but I could use it I could use it as like a, a way to hype myself up. So I used that as my hype to see if I could get myself other jobs. Yeah. And sure enough, at the same time I had done this, I, I'd been working with this de director of photography and he took me under his wing, helped me find some jobs. And he had some friends who were uh, part of a new company and they had a show following around professional bull riders. And the show was called Beyond the Bull and it was on the Learning Channel or TLC. I want to say this is 2006. Okay. I, I, I guess I just kind of got lucky. I, I took in some of my footage from the MMA fights I had shot. I had no footage to show them of Madagascar, but they hired me because I had been there. <laughs> it was pretty much just, I'm like, I can't show you that because I don't have the footage, but here's some footage of the MMA fights I shoot. I got hired because of the MMA footage, but my foot got in the door because of Madagascar. So how many times has this happened in this industry? Because it feels like there's a, 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 a really strong sense of mentor-mentee, like people taking you under the wing, a little apprenticeship stuff going on. That's not, doesn't seem like the way most people get their jobs in yeah. like every yeah. other industry. It is. It definitely is. There, it's a lot of who, and and it's also a situation where you you do have to foster that and and maintain it because later on in my career I I got stuck in one show like around the times I started having kids and it was a show that kept going. It was Storage Wars and that show just kept getting order after order and it was great when my kids were young because it was good money. But the problem was I stayed on it for too long and let my contacts and other realms of the business atrophy. I guess you could say. Yeah, it's very much like it's something you have to maintain. Try to keep yourself in a lot of people's linus and also market yourself. And I, that's something I'm not good at. I need to be much better about marketing myself because that's how you're going to catch the people that you don't know. But yeah, it's and, and most jobs I have just come from people I've met along the way. So TLC, it's a weird thing because Discovery Channel came out and I feel like there's all these Discovery Channel type channels. Now, I don't know the whole hierarchy behind the scenes here, but like the History Channel, Learning Channel, did all the stuff that seemed to be about the stuff that the channel says, you know, the name of the channel says it was about, right? History and learning. And then all of a sudden something happened. I don't know what year this was. I'm flipping channels and there's stuff like Storage Wars on the Learning Channel. It's like where all these oh, yeah. channels just went to just weird shows in themselves are interesting, but just you'd never think like that would be on the Discovery Channel. Like what is yeah. going on? So what is that all about? 
I think it, it has to do with ad sales. They're all driven by ad sales and focus groups. They started, I, I can't really remember when TLC would have made the transition from, but TLC had like a Honey Boo Boo. What am I learning from Honey Boo Boo? But for whatever reason, maybe it's the MT, MTV effect. I know MTV got bought by Viacom and then MTV stopped showing music videos. I think it has a lot to do with their focus groups. They're taking audiences in and they're saying like, watch this and turn up the dial on stuff you like and turn down the dial on stuff you don't like. I don't know if that's how those actually work. I've heard something similar. Yeah, it's but, like a good or bad thing. Is that tell us? Because if, if that's true, it's, oh man, should we be worried about what people want to watch? It's, if that's, is that a mirror to like human, like American society? It's we're wanting, wanting to watch these shows more than things a little bit more yeah. educational. And then in terms of how a show gets picked up by a network, the network is going to see a lot of pilots and a lot of little sizzle reels. And I've shot a lot of little sizzles that never went anywhere, probably because the network decided that or not decided, probably because the network took it to the ad sales people and the ad sales people say, this isn't on brand. Nobody, if this show's demographic is 35 year old housewives, the ad people can't advertise on this show for whatever reason or, or something like that. It's very, it got to be very dollar driven and Cable's whole MO was selling ad space. That's really what it was. I think it's it was a, a focus group thing tied in with demographics, tied in with ad sales. And then you end up getting Hitler aliens on History Channel. Yeah, that's crazy stuff. So now you're running most of your time is like shooting some sizzles, doing some small shoots. And then are you like basically on a show for most of your time? Is that how your day is spent or your week is spent? Yeah, and it's ebbs and flows. Like I've had some pretty massive slowdowns where, you know, I've had to go on unemployment for a few months. But a lot of times and, and then when things are really moving, it's one show to the next or um down for about a month but in that month i might have i might day play on something i might just uh, go be a camera operator for a day on something or it's pilot season so i might go shoot for a week and help the producers try to find a story and see if they can sell a show so being on the set of a tv show like this is the million dollar question you're involved in a business that everyone wants to know about there's some yeah. there's still despite all the craziness it seems like there's still like this magic magic movie making thing it's still cool how do you even work with a script and, and, and figure out how to shoot something. What's the energy like? What's it just like when you you ever wake up and just go, holy crap, I'm I'm doing this. Like I'm actually here. You know, yeah. in the middle of it. Some days it depends on the project. There's a lot of garbage out there and it's just stuff you gotta work on. Especially if you're just a camera operator. You're just getting a paycheck. It's a good paycheck, but you're you might you're not really that emotionally invested in it. You're just I'm gonna point the camera at this and I'm gonna do what they want and when I'm done I'm gonna go home. But then and there's other things uh, like like currently on Jay Leno's Garage. That's a lot of fun every day, just because it's high profile. We get to play with a lot of fun toys. Obviously, like we just had the 2022 uh, GT3 from Porsche in the other day. So we're just crazy. You know, we got cool stuff, and it really depends. Like I'm, I could be a big fanboy for something that that I just happen to be working on that day, or I ha I, I can't get off set quick enough. I want to go home because I don't care about these people. I had some friends who just shot the most recent Hills, old, old MTV Hills, and it was a nightmare because those people aren't the best people in the world. And so it just depends on what it is. I've, I, when I first moved out, I was a PA on some kind of bigger films, but those films are so big. The days that I was a PA wasn't principal photography. I was like showing up to help out with plate shots of scale miniatures of a building that they were going to blow up or something. And I just, so I saw in that kind of world, like, just how big shows operate like a lot of it isn't happening on the main principal photography set a lot of it's happening in secondary units and stuff like that yeah th those kind of shows i think you i don't know if it's they're hiring your, you for your demeanor or like that you as a uh, cinematographer that you've already worked with other celebrities i and a lot of that in that world a lot of those people have agents so like a lot of the top level cinematographers have agents, so they're getting jobs kicked to them just the way, same way maybe actors are. And plus, some cinematographers get known for stuff. So you might be chosen to shoot this because you shot something else, like another war flick or something like that. But the, what it's like to be on set is it's all over the place, as far as I'd say. It, 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 I don't know, that just reminded me like, so a lot of times you're on the crew, maybe you're shooting on location and it's a busy street, and people are always curious hey, what are you shooting? One of the famous old old jokes that you always tell somebody to just get them to go away is you just tell them it's a mayonnaise commercial. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you told you me tell that once. 
You told me that once. Yeah, I, I asked I you about I something did. on Instagram. I was like, what are we shooting here? Because I saw helicopters running around Zuma Beach. And I was like, what is going on? And uh, you're like, ah, oh, yeah. they're shooting mayonnaise. I think it was a Mercedes it, commercial is, is I think what it was. Because there it was November and there were a whole wardrobe with Santa. Like, what the hell are Santa suits doing out on the beach? In California. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, that's I, I, I do remember telling you that. Yeah. And it, it's funny because if you tell somebody that it's usually like some surly old grip or, or teamster who's relaxing by his truck and they, somebody comes by and they're like, what are you guys shooting? He goes, that's the mayonnaise commercial. And <laughs> people are going to go, oh, OK. And they're going to move on. They don't care about a mayonnaise commercial. <laughs> yeah. And you might say that to something that is high profile, but you want to keep it under wraps. You, know, you just try to tell them. Oh, that's nothing. Whatever it's going to take to get them to move along so you don't really talk about it. Or like a lot of times with the Jay Leno, when we're on location, we just tell them like, oh, we're doing a shoot for Jay Leno's garage. And oh, cool. We want an audience. So we're, we're not going to be secretive about what we're doing. We want people to get excited about it. Tell them what it is. Yeah. So that seems exciting. Yeah. So I say the word camera and it's like a very different word when I, when I, like when I think of camera and when you think of camera now. So just explain to me like the complexities of a real camera system. And and I want to talk about that. And also, I, I want to get into what your thoughts are on that line from a consumer standpoint being blurred, because regular people like yeah. me oh, have yeah. access to stuff now that only you guys had access to. But what is a real film camera like, digital and film? What's it take to operate something like that? So my first thing would be, there's a, the, the, one of the cameras I have right now that I really like, that anybody could buy, almost anybody could buy, is the, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K. Shoots 6K, it shoots raw, and a lot of these cameras, no matter if we're talking about the Blackmagic, or the, if I were to tell people to buy two cameras, and if you had a low budget, I'd tell you to buy the, the Blackmagic. If money's not an object, I'd tell you to buy an Aerie. At either, in either case, it doesn't really take too much to get them up and running on set, but it does take a little bit of knowledge about what you're going to do with the footage in post. A lot of these digital cameras, they you need to know more about what you're doing in post to really get the most out of them. So what's cool about that Blackmagic is it shoots raw, but it's 2500 bucks. That's it. And some engineers might say it's not like legitimate raw, but it's like, like shooting raw takes a lot of processing power. What's raw for people who don't know? So RAW is basically the data straight off the sensor. It hasn't been processed in any way in the camera. The pixels just send out the data and it goes to storage. And then what that affords you is a lot of leeway in post to, to bring up the contrast, being down the contrast, so shift colors one way or another to ultimately create a mood for what you're going for. And you can do that with cameras that shoot whatever codec, like um, a MOV file or something like that. But you don't have as much leeway in post with that. The, the image has already been burned in a little bit, depending on what your other settings are. But this day and age, a lot of what we're doing happens in post. I, like I always try to strive and tell people you should try to make, you should try to achieve the look you're going for on set as much as possible. But just know that you can take it in any direction. If you shoot in raw or well, another setting that I like, which is not as data heavy as raw, is it's called log and it's basically like video always had trouble in the past with highlights like you can see behind me that's clipping behind me or it's close to it and what log does is it kind of rolls off those highlights a lot more so you have you have a lot more leeway in high contrast situations and i think i, I guess log would be uh, it's an engineer thing i can't really tell you too much about it technically but it's a logarithmic way of dealing with the, the darkest and lightest parts of what's in your what's in your shot. So, um, so that's the sensor and the the kind of the housing of the sensor and stuff. What about the glass and how do you go about getting this look? Like when you're looking at somebody's videos, like a home video or something, or just an amateur, or even something that's a small budget production, and then you go to a movie and you get this mm -hmm. cinema look. What is it you're doing? How do people get that look that just instantly tells people when you see it, oh, that's a movie, or that's pro? There's yeah. something about that, and I can't put my finger on exactly what that is. Yeah. It's probably, well, honestly, what, can you talk uh, about that? A lot of, uh, the glass is extremely important. And you know, like, a lot of cinematographers and upcoming cinematographers lo uh, all try strive to shoot anamorphic. And anamorphic, for those who don't know, is widescreen, basically. You, the anamorphic lens squeezes the image, and then you have to unsqueeze it to make it you know, widescreen. But all these lenses, especially the high-end ones, have their own character. And maybe it's because they are hand-ground glass. 
or they have special coatings on them to sort of like flare the right way or or to render skin tones just the right way some of these lenses are as much as a car just one we're talking thirty thousand dollars for a lens and come on if you want a whole set yeah are you serious we're talking yeah absolutely some of the best lenses, just the name Zeiss Master Primes or Zeiss Signature Primes, Cooks. Cooks have are known to have a beautiful kind of softness to them, and you probably see a lot of Cooks through Roger Deakins' work. He's the DP of 1917. Although I don't know if they use Cooks on that, but these are high dollar precision made pieces of equipment. And if you're getting a whole set, you're basically you're buying what a Pagani. What you're buying, you're spending that much money. You're buying a house and. Why are you paying that much? Because there's not many made. Like they're they're precision made. And why are they better than say like just your regular old Canon L series glass? Probably for the the L series are machine made for the most part and they're mass produced, whereas these lenses aren't. Not that L series is great glass, but it, it's also designed for still photography more than it is for cinematography. Like one of the main ways to tell that you have a cinematography lens is if it's measured in T stops as opposed to F stops. And I believe T-stops is just a more precise um, measurement of, it's the exact measurement of how much light is passing through where F-stops is an approximation. And then they're big, they're they're big bulky pieces of of equipment and they have gears on the focus so that you can put a follow focus machine on it and pull focus remotely. And you can tell by how they're focused. Those big lenses have huge focus travel and you, the optics, you can just tell by the optics. And I think maybe the average watcher looks at that and, and identifies that as uh, cinema. But also then we're talking about the, the, plane, the, the plane of the sensor or, or the film. The bigger the plane, the bigger the field of view. Right. Uh, and also the shallower the focus will be. So there's that too. And then it's post-production, like creating a look with a computer or film. Like a film is still shot to this day and – a lot of people spend a lot of money trying to replicate its grain and uh, the way it handles highlights. Just there's some people, I, I don't know if I fully subscribe to this, maybe a little bit, but some people feel just film is more organic. Is this relegated to make, more or, or just like natural looks or certain directors, the whole Christopher Nolan obsession with film? Is he a one-off in the industry or is it, you think it's making a comeback or how do you feel about digital versus film? I think every tool has a place. Like people like um, Nolan and, and Tarantino. I think Tarantino is into film because he likes making films the old school way. I think Nolan, I think a lot of those people will tell you they get a different emotional response looking at film as opposed to digital. I think you can go a long way making digital look like film, especially if you use Aries. I think Aries, as far as how their sensors are made, they've achieved an organic look digitally better than anybody. And they came from film. Like Aries were an industry standard in, in film and still are. But everybody like talks about reds and reds are great, but it's just a different tool. It's, I, I think reds integrate better when you have a lot of visual effects. They were the fir- actually speaking of raw, Red was the first company to figure out how to do raw in a tight compact camera without having to send to some separate hard drive. So uh, these huge lenses, really expensive glass, very expensive housings and sensors, different settings for each all, all that stuff. Getting familiar with all that and then operating it, what's it like operating something that on like that size on a crane, on a dolly, on a set, on like a Marvel production or something crazy where there's like tons of cameras going on. What's it like to just operate that thing? Yeah, so in the digital side of things, really not that, once once you get your head around it a little bit, they're really not that complicated to operate. You have to know a couple settings that are kind of like up to the, the operator themselves. There's a, a thing you can turn on called peaking. And basically what peaking does is blooms the highlights when they're in focus. So basically, you just use peaking to help you be in focus. But besides that, they're uh, maybe I'm just speaking from experience. They're not that intimidating. Like film is a little different because you're dealing with more mechanical parts and you're dealing with the fact that you're exposing onto film and you're not going to be able to see the results until it's been to the lab. You can obviously there's a video assist coming out of film cameras, but the operator isn't using the video assist. They're looking through the eyepiece. A lot of times on those kind of cameras, you have to push your head into them. To open up the and see, you know, actually see uh, through to the ground glass that's right behind the prism that's right behind where the film plane is. And also on some of those older film cameras, when you stop down on the lens, 
what you're seeing through the uh, eyepiece is dark. If you have to shoot a scene stop down, it can be hard to see what you're shooting, which is why people shoot wide open for a lot of reasons, to throw focus and stuff like that. But if it's wide open, you can see a lot easier through those eyepieces. It seems like some of these movies that are shot a lot digitally or with a lot of visual effects, so there's a lot of like blue screen or, or green screen or other elements in there. But what films or what situations have you been in where the camera operators just seem like they're in freaking danger, right? Like they're out there in the action. Have you been in a set or a shoot that's like yeah. that? When I did that bull riding show, now I was never out on the where the bulls are uh, kicking. But you're right up next to the to the rails, like the chute right before they they go out, and you can feel the power of that animal. I saw some pretty gnarly knockouts. A rider dismounted as the bull was swinging around with his back legs and just Whoa. knocked right into him. It was out cold. There's been situations like like I wasn't on this season of Jay Leno's Garage, but there was a situation where some operators were a little too close to the road. And yep. maybe on the, what is it, the outside of the turn instead of the inside of the turn. And because of that day, we have to wear safety vests and learn track safety and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, I can't really th think of too many things off the top of my head. I'm what trying to movie? think of friends too. I, I, yeah, I was going to say, what movies like, can I, you I think of? What movies for dangerous situations? What movies do you respect where as, a, as someone uh, with a lot of camera operating experience and cinematography that you're looking at going, holy crap, how did they do that? Or that's nuts. It's honestly some of the older films. Have you seen French Connection? No. French Connection, you should definitely watch it because they wrote the book on modern car chase scenes. And they did that, I think it's the early 70s. This is um, William Friedkin? And they I've did it heard without of this. permits in the Bronx. Oh, wait. I've seen that shot where that they almost ran someone over because they didn't tell someone or they didn't tell people like what was yeah. going on or they just paid them like 10 bucks yeah, more. They were out there without permits. Yeah. <laughs> they used rudimentary car mounts. And prior to that movie, uh, I could be wrong on one or two little detail uh, like other movies, but prior to that movie, nobody shot car chase scenes like that. And to this day, people are still using a lot of those techniques, like things of technology for how you move the camera and mount the camera has gotten better. But when you want to talk about absolutely raw, thinking on your feet, doing it gorilla, that film is, you got to watch it. Like nothing but respect for what they did in those days. You, you got to go get permits for a reason. And in this day, if they had gotten caught in this day and age, they people would have been thrown in jail. Like you just, you can't shoot like that anymore. But I yeah. think they woke up early in the morning and tried to use the streets when they were less traffic on a Sunday. They tried to be as responsible as they could while still getting this extremely raw realistic chase scene so absolutely go watch the for the friends connection great movie what else then like other old films like ben hur that's a huge production i don't even comic book films don't reach that level of manpower to make it maybe some do there's probably some there's still like big scenes but take 1917 for example those are some pretty big epic scenes what'd you um, think of that movie and they i thought it was uh technically amazing story okay not you know story was was good i've heard there's some uh, historical in inaccuracies to it i don't know exactly what those are but overall it was good like i'm watching it as a filmmaker and having read about it and like it's supposed to be one single unedited take or obviously wasn't but that's how it's in real time so logistically i'm watching it for that and i, I thought from the craft side of things it absolutely well executed and something like that back in the day probably would have taken maybe twice to three times as many people to help him make it. I, I, I was mentioning Ben-Hur, it's the famous chariot scene, and I think two stunt people died making that scene. And as something from that era goes, that was a pretty epic filmmaking. But I couldn't imagine, I, I think that whole scene took a month to make. They took so much and, longer to make it well. Yeah, to make it well, it took way more planning I, and, and like, 1917 everything was planned i think i remember them reading one of the a good uh, magazine to read if you really want to know how they make stuff is american cinematographer and i i read the article in that before they even shot anything on in principal photography they'd shoot rehearsals on a dslr to see how long that that little particular portion of the movie was going to take and so then they they got an idea so then they tell art department they need the trench to be this long so that they can get that one little portion tracking back with the character in real time and not have and have just the right amount of set to work with and then also and then the passing the camera off to a crane everything was coordinated before they even shot a single piece of principal photography 
Who is like your hero cinematographer? When I was considering becoming a cinematographer, Conrad Hall is one of my favorites. American Beauty, Road to Perdition, and then uh, Roger Deakins. I, he's a rock star these days, and it, it's surprising it took him so long to get an Oscar. He like Coen Brothers love him. He pretty much he hasn't shot everything from the Coen Brothers, but he has uh, shot a fair portion of their movies. He did 1917. He's amazing, and he's not one of those cinematographers who, who's uh, typecast. He's he can do it all. Yeah. No Country for Old Men. What else? So many good films. Um, oh, that reminds me. What do you think about like the camera work in movies? I'm Extraction. I think it was just for Netflix. Netflix made it. It was like Chris Hemsworth. It was really heavy action. It's basically just like a two two hour star vehicle action. But it was like a lot of handheld. They stitched a lot of shots together to make them look like it was one continuous um, yeah. scene. And I'm trying to think. Was Extraction a military film? I, I don't know if I've seen kind it. Kind of. But I'm, I may have. If what you're saying about it, like handheld work and, and single take, that's all. That's like a lot of pre-planning, even with handheld. And when we're talking about those kind of films, we're talking about a big rig. So it's something that, that the operator is not going to be able to hold on to for very long. You're going to you're gonna want to put that thing down after like how heavy 30 we're talking minutes, about. 40 pounds, 50 pounds, probably not 50 pounds, but and, and maybe like they're going to try to lighten it if it's a handheld yeah. movie. Yeah. But they're still going to... They have to put transmitters on it to send a video signal to Video Village, probably remote follow focus. So they have motors with follow focus on it for the camera assistant to have a monitor offset. And you know, so basically on those kind of films, the operator can hold with two hands. They don't have to touch the lens. Like in documentary, you're pulling your own focus. So you have to touch the lens and all that kind of stuff. But at least you sit back and hold two handles, look through the eyepiece, let the scene happen. You've probably rehearsed it, what's going to happen. And then then the editors and the director, they're all working out like how to hide those cut points. Yeah. I remember 1917 when they go into one of the bunkers. Now you can tell there's a cut there. but So everything you guys do is manual focus. Like you're always uh, adjusting. May, I, w I would say yes m most of the time. Although there might be some specialty shot or a lot of commercial commercials use motion control. And motion control is going to have – it's going to – not only is it going to have the movement, but – there's going to be a focus motor on the lens because motion control needs that. In that regard, but that's all been programmed. Those Some of those motion control machines are amazing, and you need a programmer to help you fix set up the shot. So in that regard, I wouldn't say it's autofocus, but it's it's programmed focus. But yeah, for the most part, if you want to give the actors a, a more realistic world to work in, then you kind of got to have somebody who's going to pull focus. Actors might not hit their mark. Before a, before a take, a lot of times, you know, the second camera assistant will pull a tape measure out from a little hook that's on most cameras right where the film plane is so you can get a precise measurement. So they'll they'll pull it out to the actor's nose so it's 13 feet so then they know on uh, they can mark on their their little wheel where that mark is. But if the actor doesn't hit that mark then you know they have to adjust it and find the focus. So got it. Yeah. So interesting. So what do you think about I want to uh, actually just going back a little bit to the reality TV, what was your experience like in general? I mean, you spent a lot of time on a lot of episodes. Uh, you know, when I looked you up, there's a Pawn Stars, uh, a couple others as well, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, Pawn the, Stars. Uh, I did a, a cooking show with the French chef, Little Bites America. What else? Yeah, Pawn Stars was fun. Wars. I had a lot of fun on that. Yeah, well, tell yeah, me what Star that was. Wars was what was Pawn Stars? Because I, the question everyone's asking, is it real? Like, how real is it? And what's it like to shoot in that? So the things brought in are real uh, on that show. They're, they're actual, maybe they're actual high dollar antiques. Maybe they're not. The assessment you're getting is real. When they bring in an expert, that's all. But those people have been cast ahead of time. People are submitting like, well, this is my father's Revolutionary War okay. musket, stuff like that. So they're, they're cast and... Things can get stale. Okay, we've done historical weapons too many times. We've done enough of those. Every now and then you get somebody who calls in something interesting. Like my one of my favorite things I did on that show was somebody brought in a Volkswagen bus 26 window, which is has those windows at the curve towards the roof. Yeah. Those things are extremely rare. And this one was perfectly restored. <laughs> and I think at the time that thing was worth the guy wanted 140,000 for it. Wow. I forgot who the who the character from the show was who appraised it. But he came down maybe 20000 on it. But still, that's a lot of money. And I had no idea that, like, the 26-window VW bus was so rare. And, in fact, they're all getting rare now. They, we used to see them all the time as kids. Now those things are – they've been picked over for parts. Totally. And the ones you on the road are either restored or, or resto-modded. And they're not going for cheap these days at all.
What are those two guys like? It was professional kind of setting. Like, and I liked it because I was signed on for a 12 hour day, but basically I was done when they were done. And your role, just to be clear on that show was are you camera operator. You? I was a camera operator. Yeah. Yeah. I go. And at that time they had, they had started trying to build a mock-up set of the main shopping floor in the back of the building so that they could start shooting simultaneously. They could have, because they had to close down the store every time we wanted to shoot. Because anybody who appears on camera has to sign a release, and it can be hard if it's like a open store, can't control the audio as well, all that kind of stuff. My time on it, they were working on building a set in the back to mimic cool. the front. And yeah, you know, it was fun. It was just like they were nice guys. They came in, they did their thing, they went home. You know, and by that time the show was a pretty big hit. The formula was there. It was nobody was trying to find what the show was about. It was. And that's always a good situation. If you, if I'm day playing on a TV show, I like to come into a show that kind of knows what it's doing. I don't like going in and butting around shooting a whole bunch of stuff that isn't going to make the cut anyway. So, got um, it, got it. Yeah. So let's talk about Jay Leno's Garage because I I was watching this show when he was on just YouTube like a long time ago. And yeah. just because I've been fascinated with him and that car collection for a long time, I met him a few times at Cars and Coffee, uh -huh. where he usually used to bring something by, or that was cool. Met him and just said hi, a lot of people there, and he's extremely nice. But what's yeah. it like to be on that show? Because, well, no, actually, no, before you answer that, I want to set the stage a little bit, because I have to mention my favorite, one of my favorite shows of all time, which is okay. the rebooted Top Gear 2002, Clarkson May Hammond. Because uh -huh. I think that sets a little bit of a stage. What do you think of that show? Because when it comes to cars, it's, it's only a couple shows that have really pulled this off. I feel like that's the king yeah. of that. Do you agree? It is. Absolutely. I, as, I don't know if that genre has really been defined, but I think maybe I'd call it a car variety show. And as that kind of car uh, show goes, they, they were the ones that wrote the book on it. And they in, in the reiterations of it here in America, nobody has ever been able to uh, recapture the chemistry that those guys had. Is like, that what you think it is? I, th the, I think a huge part of that show was their chemistry. Just how they banter with each other. They're all very knowledgeable of cars. I don't know. I have a feeling they probably drove a lot of the gags that they did. Like one of my favorites is when Clarkson drives an old Rolls Royce into a swimming pool. <laughs> I can't believe. Yeah, that's right. It's a great book. If you haven't read it, there's a book by one of the screen the screenwriters or the one of the, the script editor. Sorry, uh, it's called How We Made Top Gear, or it's called it's called, it's called uh -huh. On That Bombshell: How We Made Top Gear. Uh -huh. And it's hilarious. He just talks about what everyone did. And he's like, yeah, all the good ideas were Clarkson's. But there's so many. There's just so many insane yeah. things. I'm just like, how did you get this shot? So those, the, one of the, when they first started doing those huge trips, uh -huh. I thought that was fascinating, how they captured all that, like the Japan yeah. trip or the, or the um, Africa trip. What's it like to shoot like that on location live? Is that like a, hey, Put 50 cameras up and we'll get it all, we'll figure it all out in the edit later. No, they, I would assume that they had some level of scouting going on. I think, I, I, like traveling internationally it is expensive because you have to carnet all your gear. You have to have local fixers, you know, stuff like that. But I think they had a pretty good budget and I think they were able to go ahead of time or even before they've gone, they've probably worked out a route. Like I think my favorite travel episode was the Vietnam one. That was awesome. I kind of wonder if some of the stuff was on the spot, like when they went and bought those suits. It's been a while since I've seen that episode, but I remember them getting those really uh, swanky shark skin suits or whatever. I feel like stuff like that is off the cuff, but the route they take and maybe the vehicles are pre-planned. With the, when you're going to these places, you, you just have to be ready for anything. What you set up might not be what the reality when you get there. So. I think it's a it's pre-planning as much as possible and then being ready to pivot when you get there. They made you think they wrote the book on making cars cool. Look cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the B-roll of the cars like we on Jay Leno's garage try to emulate as much as we can. Yeah, at least at the start of it when when visual of a car would pop in our heads, it was that show. Like they they'd use graduated filters to make the sky look darker and stuff like that. That was cool. We wanted to do we wanted to try to recreate that kind of Stuff. And who was responsible for that in that show? Do you know who created that Top Gear look? Because I, I don't think it saw it in the first or two seasons. I think it came in season three. It felt like there was a definite change. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look up who the DPs were, but I would assume maybe maybe the first two seasons were a lower budget because what I was saying earlier, it it can take up to two or two or three seasons for 
a show to find its formula. And then it also has to have the ratings. And if it's got the ratings and it's got the formula, then you can start, you can get a good budget, get better cameras, get better support gear. You can hire a better DP who has more experience doing that kind of stuff. So I just, I'd like to see, cause I have a feeling maybe it's had a few different DPs, but then again, maybe it, yeah. it's also maybe just had one who just locked into it. So I don't know. I'd have to look. So, dude, um, what's the garage like? What's his garage like? <laughs> the first time you walk in, and everybody says it, even people who have car collections themselves just go, holy crap, how many cars do you have? Because it just keeps going. It's, it looks like he joined a, a couple different warehouses together. And there's there's the main – there's one side is the mechanic side. And talk about a cool job. Those guys, they're working on dream stuff. And then you go the other side of the breezeway where all the cars are and – there's one big main room where he, he has his McLarens, some of his older uh, Lamborghinis, and then he's got a lot of his motorcycles in that main room. Then there's a room off to the left where he has uh, the big, huge uh, speedsters, like the, the what he, they've got that one that they put a, a World War II era Spitfire engine in. <laughs> yeah, like it's nuts, like those crazy big Bentleys, old Bentleys and stuff with. <laughs> yeah, I think with that one with the Spitfire engine, that was a 12 year project because they couldn't find a transmission that could handle the torque that that engine put out until 10 years into it. Finally, they found something that could handle the torque. <laughs> and then, it, then there's, there's two main corridors. And at, at certain points, he has them themed by brand. So he has like a Ford section. And then he has like uh, the Hudson Hornets, a couple Hudson Hornets. I love that car. I love that car. Yeah, that's a beautiful car. We, we did a shoot earlier this season with that one and then a resto mod barn find made by a company called icon um, i know icon they made did they make it to the derelict or something or yeah the derelict. derelict we shot with that one nice. yes yeah. that thing is bad and that thing's all modern under the hood it's right. it drives like a modern car jay's is historical restoration like everything in that is if it's not original it's made as original and then you got the bugatti room and that's where we do all the the b-roll we have a big soft box on chain motors that we can move and soft what's that source. mean what's that mean cars look their best when you use a big soft source heavily diffused no specular no hard light is is hitting it and so we have this big soft box and we can lower it on chain motors and tilt it one way or another stuff like that and it just that soft it just like any reflective surfaces that's what it's going to look good um lighting it is it fun uh shooting that show yeah yeah it's a lot of fun my favorite thing i'm i'm one of the ronin operators uh, when we do uh, when we go out on the road with the cars i sit in the back we have a ronin 2 on a flex arm from a company called and they're really cool but, but we have definitely pushed them to their limits and we've had some problems this season they are we had to send them back basically to i uh, have the motors fixed or something because Midway through the season, we were getting all kinds of shimmies and shakes out of them. And then one day when we were huh. shooting with Koenigsegg, it just – the Ronin just completely uh, fried and just went – was going. it was doing this. It was like oh, it was gosh. possessed. Because but the yeah, car's sitting, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like the Koenigsegg just there. broke your Ronin because it was – with its coolness. Yeah. Actually, I don't oh, like that car. Good. I don't like that car. Do you like that car? I, I, I don't – I wouldn't want to own it. Like even if I could, I wouldn't want to own it. I, I just – what would I do with it? I, I sell it for a lens? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'd do. I'd sell it for a set of lenses. <laughs> That's what I, I, and I'd get I'd get a return on investment, and I wouldn't lose. I'm, I guess Koenigsegg's probably keep their money, maybe. I don't know. But lenses definitely keep their money. And I, they're amazingly engineered. You got From a design and engineer standpoint, they're awesome. But from a practical standpoint, I can think of supercars that – I'd rather have. And I honestly, that GT3 was pretty amazing and can be practical. Jay likes to joke that Porsche owners brag about how many miles their car has, whereas like a Ferrari owner brags about how many miles it doesn't have. So Porsches are designed to be drived. I like that kind of thing. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's all cool, but it's, I, I would go for what's more practical. What's, what was your favorite car to shoot on that show? Let's see. I got it like that that Hudson um, Hornet I was talking about. A lot of the old cars, a lot of his old English cars. Another thing I use a Lucy. I use a lot of the. I, I put my Black Magic on this motion control thing, and we we get it inside the car and do like interior beauty shots. And a lot of those old English cars he has have the 
like the wood the wood dashboard like just beautiful cars like and all these like the dials are even beautiful i think um, i would take those dials any day over i yeah I, as i get older i'm like are you getting like this are we just getting old where we feel like this older stuff just looks and feels better it smells better it looks better it feels better i take dials leather and switches and toggles that that make a noise when you flip the switch versus yep, yep. what's in a tesla and more with manual the screen yeah yeah there's, I think there's more of a, you're not separated by a computer doing thinking for you in those cars. It's just you, the steering wheel, the stick, the clutch. You're feeling it all. It's You're operating it all. So what do you think, so that seems like an insane experience shooting with him in that show. But you were talking about that kind of equipment you're using and the lighting and all that stuff. And I'm realizing from what you're saying how important lighting is to make things look professional and good and to tell that story. Uh -huh. But let, if I just go zoom out and look at this consumer space that's going crazy with video, it feels like everybody mm -hmm. is a videographer these days. You've got TikTok and YouTube and platforms and stuff on your phone and you talk about the Ronin, that's affordable. That's within the range of, I've got a, I've got a gimbal from DJI, it's good enough. But the Pocket Osmo yeah. Mini or whatever, it's good. So things like that are affordable for regular people to create stuff. What do you think about that? What do you think about this whole movement where everyone is creating video now? Yeah, I think it's cool. It definitely has democratized gear, stuff that you can only dream about doing. Now you can do for under uh, $5,000. You could have a whole setup for under $5,000 and do the same thing somebody did even just 10, uh, 15 years ago that would have costed uh, 50 to $100,000. Like what? So, for example, there's a, uh, a company called Tilta, and they make a wireless follow focus system called the Nucleus. And it consists of a motor that goes on the rods that fit onto the teeth of the lens, and then a certain, like a, either a wheel to control the focus or a, a handheld grip with a, a couple little wheels on it. The Nucleus M system goes for $1,200. Now, the high end competition, uh, and I'm not saying that. Uh, the tilt is better than the high-end competition, but there's a company called Preston that makes a lot of the high-end follow-focus stuff. And a Preston setup is going to cost you $30,000. Maybe the, the Preston stuff is going to last you a lot longer. It's probably going to have stronger motors, overall better build quality, but not really. I am I'm thoroughly impressed with tilt, Tilta's little $1,200 follow-focus setup. And it's $1,200 isn't that far out of reach for a lot of people. 30,000, so right now, now we're talking out of reach. So when you look at like YouTube or TikTok, are you like, hey, this is cool, it's gimmicky, and people are just having fun? Or are you seeing or spotting real talent or potential? Are, are things popping out at you where you're going, wow, that's someone, if they just put some time into this, they have real potential to make something very cool and big and profitable? Yeah, I do see, I see some really cool stuff, but I also think it's, you got to sift through a lot of garbage and a lot of people can buy this stuff and make it look good, but for whatever reason, maybe they just don't have the talent for editing it or their, their subject matter is boring, but there's definitely people out there that make really cool stuff. I was just, I can't remember the name of the, the channel, but I was watching a comparison of uh, some old Canon still lenses called the uh, FD mounts. And FD mounts are the same as an old Canon cinema lens called K35s that shot at Alien. So what this channel did is they superimposed themselves into scenes from Alien. And through whatever post techniques they used, they made it look really good. They made it look like they were an alien. Like the host is like sitting there in scene and they've, sh they've set up their dialogue to match uh, dialogue from the movie itself while staying relevant to the lens test they were doing for this video. If you probably, if you Google or if you type in FD, ultimate FD lens test into YouTube, that will probably be the first hit though. You're, because of YouTube's algorithm, you're gonna see the most popular ones. And then whenever I'm reviewing gear, if I wanna decide if I wanna buy something, all those people who do those gear reviews have really slick looking videos, but not all of them are great. Like I'm, some sometimes they go overboard with something. They over explain, you know, stuff like that. So. I think when it comes to those kinds of videos, there's a lot out there that you got to sift through to find what's really good. And most of it probably really isn't that good. Have you tried VR yet? Have you put on the whole VR setup? Yeah. A couple years ago, I got to go shoot the behind the scenes of Dan Carlin, the hardcore, hardcore history. history. Yeah. You I know, love Dan Carlin. 
he he consulted with this company who did a VR for his Blueprint to Apocalypse. Um, oh, so that's the World War One series, right? Yeah. So they built this a VR set that was like a trench, but it was the whole experience because they you put the goggles on and they they start it up and you start in one of those what looks like you're in a balloon. Like back in the, those days, they sent officers up in balloons to get reconnaissance. So you start that way. And then as the, the VR experience progresses, you come down from the balloon and you instantly go into the trench and there's haptic feedback on the ground. So when there, there's explosion in your goggles, you feel the ground shaking. And then you, you move towards the end of the trench and there's a charge about to happen. And they all have their gas masks on and they all charge out and all get mowed down. It's, it's pretty brutal. It was- <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, pretty it, depressing. Yeah, and you wrap around into the bunker. They had hung some some fake rats. So when you're in the goggles, dead rats hanging, and you can reach up and touch them. Like, they were still trying to get the depth, because it was a little off. Like, I was feeling the rat here, where it was here in my vision. And it was still a work in progress when we were there. What'd you but think of it, were really, Oh, it was really cool. It was video game-like, though, because it was like it was... A, all animation that's my most recent experience with vr so i haven't had to i haven't experienced a lot of it yet but if that was uh, something to go on then it's really cool and i'd love to uh, try more of it what do you think is the future for video and in the sense of immersive technologies like vr and ar is something important because apple's rumored ar glasses that may be coming out the ability with LiDAR and stuff stuck into our phones and iPads to create AR experiences really easily and accessible. What are the opportunities, especially for people who have trained classically, like you, to get uh, into the space and make cool stuff? I, I know of one guy that I've shot with who, who has gone into VR full time as a, a camera operator. I'm not quite sure what he does, but he's involved with setting up the cameras and, and acquiring the images that eventually go into probably where VR really happens, which is in the computers. So I think there's probably jobs out there, but I also think, I think you're going to see, because VR kind of requires a, a level of precision, like I was saying, like reaching out and touching something and having it be in the right depth and all that kind of stuff. I feel like the camera work for that kind of stuff is going to probably be more of a robotic kind of thing. I just don't think you're going to need a... a, a a human's not going to be able to to do that. Do I think we'll still be watching screens like oh, the way we have been for the last hundred years? I think so, because we still go watch plays on a stage, too. COVID's been hitting everyone really hard. I know it's been hitting your industry. What do you think? Do you think people are going to come back to theaters? you think theaters are going to open again? and, and or, or are we stuck with streaming services now? I don't know. I really, I, I hope that that tradition continues. I think it's a good tradition. I think if you talk to actors, we'll say being on the stage is where the true craft of acting is because you don't get a second take. You maybe get a, a second performance, but from that standpoint, I think they all want to come back. I'm not a big musical fan, but there are people, hardcore musical fans out there. That's the only way you can experience them. There's nothing like seeing them on the stage. And same with movies. I, not everybody's going to want to put on a, a pair of goggles to have a fully immersive experience all the time. Sometimes you want to be passive and just let the story happen in front of you. So yeah, I think, I think that my my world can coexist with VR um, and AR. AR also seems like it has uses beyond entertainment. You could you could have your AR glasses on and maybe it's gonna tell you there's an accident ahead, stuff like that. And entertainment, like Pokemon Go can now be in your glasses. <laughs> Pokemon Go is amazing. It never gets enough credit. Even in the health circles, it doesn't get enough credit. I think Pokemon Go created more physical activity than like any doctor during that same time me telling someone to do something like go walk or whatever yeah, i didn't yeah, know i remember that i was on like the down low of what was happening i was i was didn't check the news or wasn't paying attention for a couple of days so all i kept seeing were people standing around outside like zombies like what the hell's going on yeah <laughs> no i remember that yeah and it got people who like the hardcore video game people who are used to sitting down, got them off the couch and moving around. And to it, maybe the, I, I also remember, what was it? The Nintendo, uh, not before the Switch, that had like tennis. The Wii. Yeah, the Wii. That, yeah, exactly. That, that got people up and moving. And that got me thinking and going into VR. Like, I played soccer and I've always, and, and one of my favorite video games to play is FIFA. So, what if there was a 360 degree treadmill that moved with the program? And then you wore a special suit that had sensors on it that you know, gave you the feel of kicking a ball. And you could sprint and this treadmill would move with you and you could maybe even you could slide tackle. You could get knocked down, all that kind of stuff. Like, 
there was a, that. There was a prototype for something like that, and I saw it at one of the game conferences. I forgot what the GDC or one of those things, and it was a guy playing Battlefield. So he had the fake gun, and he had VR things on, and I was looking at it, and I'm a, obviously a big fan of physical activity and promoting that. At the same uh-huh. time, I was like, damn, dude. It's just, I'd rather just sit down on the couch and push, like, the thumbsticks. It's, that seems like a lot of work. If you actually had yeah. to run, like, the, in, in Call of Duty, if you had to run those miles in real life, you'd be a really crappy player. This is tiring. Yeah, really tiring, and, and you'd probably get found out tactically. If you fought against some people who are actually veterans who've d- been in those situations, they're, they're going to know how to deal yeah. with that better than some average Joe. I was just thinking the the free solo climber guy, Alex Honnold. Yeah. So what if they had a a treadmill climbing wall and you put your goggles on and you get to experience free climbing El Capitan? (laughs) Hey, what's the future look like for you? Like, what do you want to do? I've been teaching my, like like I said a a lot earlier, I didn't go to art school because I didn't want to sit in front of a computer. But as I get older and I'm like, what I do is pretty physical. It's uh, a lot, sometimes shouldered up on your feet all day. There's going to come a time when I can't really do that that much anymore. So for me in particular, I've been training myself to do color grading. And it's like I was saying with cameras these days, cameras that do raw and cameras that shoot and a log gamma, they need to be color corrected and they need to be color graded. What's that and mean? So color correction is when like you see me right now, I'm looking maybe a little orange. So we just want to make sure my skin tone, we're going to shift my skin tone so they look natural. That's more just like correcting a camera mistake or something like that. Color grading is kind of more the art of it where you're creating a look where you can take the same piece of footage and you can give it a dark, sinister look just by changing the shadows or maybe dropping the skin tones to look a little more blue. Or you can can bring it up and make it look happy and bring up the, the contrast and add more warm tones into it. And you can do this by using power windows, like I could put a power power window on my face and and just control what's in that power window and then track it throughout the shot. And so then, this is in uh, software. This is using software. Yeah, this is in You've software. already shot this stuff. The main yeah, the main piece of software and, and it, once again this is the company Black Magic who they make hardware and then they also own DaVinci Resolve, which is my favorite piece of software. I'm trying to tell people to get out of Adobe because with DaVinci Resolve you don't need a subscription. You, you buy it for 300 bucks, it's yours, and each upgrade you get for free. And it's an all-in-one, so you get a media a media compile, or like, uh, what is it, what do they call it? Uh, it's basically the, the media ingestion window, and that helps you organize all your media. Then there's the cutting uh, room, where you can uh, scrub through your footage and find where you wanna cut. And then there's the editor. Then there's the color part of it, the color grader. There's an audio part of it, there's a compositing part of it, and then there's an output part of it. So it's a really good piece of software. I highly recommend if you're trying to get into editing um, and post-production, don't mess around with Adobe. Get Blackmagic DaVinci Resolve. So skip Final um, Cut, skip Premiere, go straight to Resolve? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I don't. I think you should know everything because every, uh, everybody's going to use everything. And these days, most people I run into uh, use Premiere. Although, like, the company I've been working for right now, they use Avid. So... There's, it's still all out there. You should probably try to know it all if you want to be an editor. But DaVinci Resolve, I think, is just the best because it's all in one. You can you can take something from start to finish without having to change over a bunch of software. It's all right there for you. There might be a better compositor out there like 3D Studio Max or, or the composi- uh, After Effects, but you have to do the round tripping from one piece of software to the other with that. And then you have to pay Adobe the subscription every month uh, or once a year or whatever. And DaVinci Resolve... There's no round tripping. It's all in the same program. It's it's all under the same project. It's way, I think it's way better. So you've been using uh, Resolve so, to, to learn to grade? Yeah. that's. I started just using – because it, when it first came out, it, it was strictly pretty much just a uh, color correction um, and color grading piece of software. And it's funny because it used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars when it first came out. Now it's $300. Crazy. And – yeah, and it's amazing. It, you definitely have to have a powerful computer. It's very graphics card heavy, um, especially if you're going to be working in 4K <coughs> or higher. But if you have a computer that can handle it, it's amazing. Very nice piece of equipment, uh, piece of software. This is what you want to work on. Do you want to shift more of your full-time attention to color grading? I think so. I think I still have uh, a good 10 years in, in my body to do the physical stuff. 
But that said, if if I start building much more of a, a color grading reel and somebody sees it and wants to offer me a job, I'd probably consider at this point making the transition. Also, being on set, it's it can be unstable monetarily. It can be unstable schedule-wise. So it's hard for me uh, to schedule a, a vacation with my family. So if I get into post or get into color grading, that's more of a nine-to-five more family friendly and the shows i'm on like jay leno's garage is nice because it's it's a nine to five and i can be home at night and it's not very travel intensive i've done shows in the past before i was married where i was out on the road for 13 weeks the longest run i did was 13 weeks you can't have plants can't have a pet you might as well not have an apartment i probably shouldn't have had an apartment at the time (laughs) probably could have taken that money and saved it but yeah it's that's the, th- the other thing, like the some of the tougher things about the business is it, it, it's and being freelance is you just you don't have like that that's reliable schedule. And if you wanted or you've thought about either writing or directing or going into these other roles that are adjacent to what you do now or, or um, being a DP in a larger a large budget uh, production I, or I would. I'd love to be a DP on on more narrative type stuff. That's something I haven't really done a whole lot of. And that kind of. I, I should probably market myself better. I can do it. I don't have the, the reel to show it, really. I have some spec commercials I've shot, so you can see that I know how to build a set and, and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I don't know about writing. I don't think I, I'm not a I'm not a good writer from scratch. I could probably help somebody and, and make it more uh, plausible for the camera. I'm, I'm going to approach it writing from like a, well, can we pull this off? Or how are we going to pull this off kind of standpoint? Yeah, I could probably direct too, but I personally, I, I like, I, I think a director is more of an artist. Uh, like they're the final say. And I think a cinematographer is more of a craftsman. And I see myself more of as, cra- as, a, as a craftsman. I like tools. I like, uh, I can make the thing for you to spec, but I'm less, and, and filmmaking super collaborative. I, I like, I like the aspect of not being the sole decision maker. I like the collaborative part of coming to a decision together with a wide group of people. Got it. So, Got it. So how can people find you right now? Are you on Twitter? Are you have a show reel? You have a place where people can get a hold um, of you if they want to work with you or if they have questions or want to follow up? They can find me on my Instagram. I, I've been on a, a social media diet and I'm trying to like set up more of a professional Instagram that's going to be more of my work related stuff. And then I need to set up a website. I have a pretty good amount of footage that I could probably throw on there for a reel and come by and people can take a look at it. That's not up yet though. I, I really, I need to get off my butt and work on it though. I need to make it happen. Uh, otherwise you can see my work on Jay Leno's Garage right now. Other shows in the past, I, could, I did that Jim Belushi marijuana show, which is a, <laughs> a fun kind of out of left field thing and previous seasons of Storage Wars. And who knows what the future has. I'm, we're about to come to an end of, the, of this season of Leno. I'm gonna have to get on the horn and, and see what's what's coming up. That's so cool. Thanks for taking the time tonight to, to touch base. I haven't talked to you in a long time. This has been great just to touch base in general, but also just to learn all this stuff, right? Because you're doing it.